a rare calm in eastern Ukraine. By and large, the ceasefire is holding. But around the region of Dibaltseva, the guns haven't quite fallen silent. Separatist artillery still targeting government positions with mortar fire, a provocation for these Ukrainian soldiers. A ceasefire has been signed, and we have orders to respect it. Did you hear that? Despite the isolated explosions, the front line is undeniably quieter than in recent days. In nearby towns, encouraged by the truce, frightened residents emerge from their shelters and take stock of the damage. It's Ukraine that did this. There was a big explosion. Grandma was thrown across the room. There are no soldiers here, only civilians. Here in the town of Svitlodarsk, the vast majority of the residents that have stayed behind support the separatists. They blame the government in Kiev for the destruction. Look what they've done to the Donbass. They've killed children. There's no such thing as a free Ukraine. I'm ashamed of this crazy country. They're not human. They should be hanged. President Poroshenko should be hanged. Until every last fascist is killed, we can't forgive them. Hang them. The sound of artillery fire still punctures the air. For weeks, the residents here have been living underground in makeshift shelters that are increasingly permanent. I served this country for 41 years, and now I've been kicked out of my home. What did I do to deserve this? I worked all my life to end up in a cellar. Few here believe the truce is anything but temporary. Despite the ceasefire, most will continue to sleep in their shelters, for now at least. This is how the ceasefire looks right now in eastern Ukraine. A pipeline hit by shelling near the town of Dubautseva. Two days into the European brokered truce between the army and pro-Russian separatists, fighting continues to rage. The battle for Dubautseva has centered around the town's strategic railway station. Earlier rebels claimed they'd taken control of it, but Kiev denied this. At the moment, there is fierce fighting on the outskirts of the town. There are clashes around the station, but our forces are holding their positions, and they are completely within their rights to open fire in response. For Kiev, it would be a major military asset in the heart of rebel-held land. For the anti-government rebels, they've got the town surrounded and say it's part of their territory. With the situation deteriorating, there seems little hope that either side will honour the Tuesday deadline to begin moving heavy weaponry back from the front line. Both sides accuse the other of repeated violations of the peace deal and say they'll only begin a pullout once a total ceasefire is observed. Ukrainian tanks retreating from Dubautseva in the war-torn east of the country. It follows days of fierce street battles, with pro-Russian rebels besieging the town. They say they now have control of Dubautseva. The president admits most government troops have left, but denies rebel claims that any troops are encircled. On the ground, exhausted government soldiers said their men had suffered heavy losses and they were unclear what the overall strategy was. I don't know. Our commanders didn't tell us whether it's retreat or just rotation. 
They just told us to change our position because a unit had been staying there for quite a long time and we had quite a lot of losses and so they took the decision that we should leave our position. Hundreds more Ukrainian troops are believed to be trapped in Debaltseva without any reinforcements. Kiev has admitted that some of its soldiers were ambushed and taken prisoner by separatists, but refused to say how many. After their ammunition was spent and the armored personnel carrier was destroyed, the group was taken into captivity by superior forces of the enemy. Debaltseva, with its key railway junction, is seen as a prize by both sides. The Minsk ceasefire deal didn't manage to resolve who the town belongs to, so it's being fought out on the ground. And as government troops are forced to retreat, it's a bitter blow for Kiev. Rebel tanks rolling into the contested town of Debaltseva in eastern Ukraine. The pro-Russian separatists say they have control of the town and are bringing in reinforcements. Hours earlier, this was a Ukrainian army checkpoint. Now no sign of government soldiers, just their burnt-out vehicles. Fierce fighting continues inside the town. The fate of the Ukrainian troops left behind unsure. We get the sense that their ammunition is running out because the supply route has been cut. Their food is also running out. We have offered them the chance to surrender, but so far they aren't giving up. I think that within a week, Debaltseva will be completely ours. Early on Tuesday, government troops began pulling out. The wounded are brought to this nearby military hospital. The death toll is unknown. Exhausted, retreating troops tell of lack of food, heavy losses and no reinforcements. We were praying all the time and said goodbye to our lives a hundred times. The rebels had really good and heavy artillery. As the two sides battle it out over this strategic town, it's the local residents who continue to suffer. There was shooting, bombing, everything flew around, the houses were destroyed, mine was hit twice, three times even, there are no windows left. A ceasefire deal signed in Minsk at the weekend now hangs in the balance. European leaders vow they'll do everything they can to keep the agreement alive. Ukraine's army beats a retreat from Dibalt Seva. Intense artillery fire hastening their flight. You call this a ceasefire. They shelled us there all the time. After weeks of resistance, the withdrawal takes just hours. Ambulances rush to reach the injured as weary troops leave the combat zone on board armored vehicles. Many barely escaped with their lives. We almost died twice, and twice we were resurrected. Having fought their way out of Dibalt Seva, for the survivors, relief is mixed with euphoria. I can't believe I survived. <laughs> He's a senior sergeant, head of the union, and not married. <laughs> I asked all my guys to go to church and light candles for those who were killed and those who are still alive. <laughs> At the overflowing morgue of Artemivsk, some casualties of the debacle of Dibalt Seva are left outside. Inside, the corpses are piled up on the floor. The remains of civilians killed during the siege lined up alongside the dead soldiers. We have had two experts here and over the past month and a half we had to deal with 200 corpses and 100 more were sent to the morgue in Dnipropetrovsk. In the aftermath of the rapid retreat, the local military leaders meet in a new improvised and secret headquarters. Their evacuation plan bypassed the Ukrainian high command that they accuse of abandoning the soldiers in Dibalt Seva to their fate. What went wrong here was down to the incompetence of the sector's senior leadership and the carelessness of the officers higher up. 
операции, антитеррористической операции. Debalt Saver is the latest significant symbolic and strategic defeat for the Ukrainian army. Despite that, the fighters of the 25th Battalion insist that they may have lost the battle, but not the war. After the fall of Debaltseve to pro-Russian separatists, the truce in Ukraine hangs by a thread. Kiev withdrew 2,500 battle-weary troops on Wednesday. The Minsk agreement signed last week was meant to be the first step towards stopping the bloodshed. Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council voted Wednesday to invite UN-mandated peacekeepers to monitor the front line and the border with Russia. We see the best option would be a police mission from the European Union. We're sure this would be the most effective and best guarantee for security in a situation where the promise of peace is not kept by Russia or those supported by it. Western powers are saying that despite the Balsave, the truce is not dead. Contacts between France, Germany, Ukraine and Russia continue, but Washington in particular was urging Moscow to do more to end the violence in eastern Ukraine. Secretary Kerry spoke with Foreign Minister Lavrov this morning. He pressed Foreign Minister Lavrov to stop Russian and separatist attacks on Ukrainian positions in Debaltseva and other violations of the ceasefire. With Russia's economy heaving after a series of sanctions, the White House warns the cost to Russia will rise if the truce is violated further. We're going to move on with our international press review with Flo Villamino. Hi there. Hi, Kat. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, one of our top news stories of the day, uh, the latest events in eastern Ukraine. Absolutely. It's uh, front page news uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, it's on the front page of the Wall Street Journal today. You can see uh, it talks about how Ukraine has ordered a retreat. And you can see a photo of a tank, a Ukrainian army tank, leading a column of trucks out of the uh, strategic city of Debaltseva. Uh, now, according to witnesses, it was quite a, a panicked retreat uh, under fire. You can actually read about it in the Kiev Post. That's a, a Ukrainian paper. Uh, you can see it talks about the escape from Debaltseva. Uh, Ukrainian soldiers tell about how they got out alive. Now, President uh, Petro Poroshenko, he's the commander in chief, he says that he personally gave an order to soldiers to retreat on February the 17th. But according to this article, soldiers say they were going to leave anyway because they felt trapped. To quote one of the soldiers, the Ukrainian soldiers, it said, if we stayed there, we would definitely either be captive or uh, dead. Now, uh, The Independent is also focusing on this in their international section uh, today. The British paper talks about the Brit, the bitter retreat. Uh, and it says that Ukraine really withdrew reluctantly from De Botsleva, but they didn't have a choice given the siege that was being waged by pro-Russian uh, rebels, a siege that Kiev and the West have called a violation, a very fragile uh, Minsk ceasefire, ceasefire agreement. Okay, meanwhile, one of the main actors in that ceasefire agreement, Russian President Vladimir Putin, getting a lot of criticism. Absolutely. The Washington Post, uh, the American paper, really lashes out against the Russian president in their editorial today. You can see here, it talks about how Russia marches on uninhibited in eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, Vladimir Putin's latest victory in Ukraine is turning into a rout. Uh, and the editorial says that, first of all, Vladimir Putin induced Western leaders to endorse this ceasefire a plan that virtually guarantees Russia or pro-Russia uh, troops control over many parts of eastern Ukraine. And now his forces uh, have been assaulting this city. It's a brazen violation of a ceasefire. Those are the words used in the Washington Post. I also pulled out a cartoon in The Independent uh, today. And to understand this cartoon, you have to know that this week, <laughs> engineers in the UK found that limpet, limpet's teeth <laughs> are the strongest biological material ever tested. A limpet <laughs> is a mollusk, actually, that lives in the sea. And you can see Vladimir Putin depicted as a limpet, really sinking his teeth there into Ukraine, so not likely to uh, let go anytime soon. Very highbrow cartoon there from The Independent. Welcome back. Time for tonight's uh, debate. Tonight, fighting continues in Debaltseve, leaving the ceasefire in eastern Ukraine looking increasingly shaky. Rebels say they've taken most of the town and now hold 80% of it. The government says it still holds a number of key positions, although it has acknowledged this evening 
than a number of its soldiers have now been surrounded. Others today were kidnapped by separatists who've been accused by Kiev of uh, destroying the ceasefire and with it any hope of peace. A presidential spokesman in Kiev today called on members of the EU and NATO to protest against the actions of the rebels. And France's foreign minister has said that fundamental parts of that ceasefire were not being respected, both in Debald Seve and because of the withdrawal of heavy weaponry, uh, which was planned for today, but uh, which uh, did not go ahead. So is that deal dead? The deal signed in Minsk last week, so-called Minsk II, which led to that ceasefire taking effect just after midnight on Saturday night. That's the question for my guests tonight. I joined here in the studio uh, by Michel uh, Grabar, who's an elected uh, member uh, of the Coordination Council of the Russian Forum here in France. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Uh, also uh, with me here in the newsroom is Anna Garmash, who was a Euromaidan activist and president of Ukraine Action Association. Thank you uh, for joining us uh, this evening. I'm also joined this evening by Julian Nandi, another regular guest on this um, uh, question, an independent journalist, and I believe you were part of one of the recent o OEC missions uh, to Ukraine. I was, I was there twice last year, We're going to for be a total at, of four dis months. discussing with you uh, on the ground perhaps some of the difficulties uh, involved. Also here in the studio is Julien Théron, who is an analyst in geopolitics uh, of conflicts and who teaches at the University of Versailles. Thank you for being with us. First, we're going to head, though, to uh, Kiev to speak to Max Tucker, who's the editor uh, of the Kiev Post and recently returned from Debalseve. What are you hearing about what's happening in the town tonight? Uh, so we have a correspondent in Debalseve um, and we've been in very close contact with a medic who's uh, still in the town. He's been trapped in the town since the 5th of February. Um, enemy forces are now closed into a distance about 500 meters away. The fighting is extremely heavy there. I mean, we saw rockets raining down all around the town last time we were in Debouts about people screaming and running for their basements. I can only imagine how bad it is now with the close quarters fighting in the city as well. What does that mean uh, um, from the point of view of the government uh, in Kiev? Should Debaltseve fall to the separatists, as it looks increasingly unlikely that it might? Uh, what would, uh, in your view, uh, be Kiev's position regarding uh, the truce, the deal that was signed in Minsk last week? Well, I think Kiev is in a very difficult position now. I mean, even before the ceasefire took effect, the separatists were saying that they didn't consider the ceasefire to apply to the Baltzva and that they would carry on uh, fighting there. They would carry on trying to capture the, the town and squeeze the Ukrainian forces out of it. Uh, the, the loss of the Baltzva now would be a, a major blow for Ukraine. Uh, it doesn't look like the fighting is going to stop anytime soon. Ukraine has said it's not going to withdraw its heavy weaponry from the front lines. The rebels said that they won't do that unilaterally. Uh, it doesn't really look like either side was very intent on keeping the peace, uh, but particularly the rebels who, who, who clearly feel that they're winning and they want to continue. Julien Théron, I'd like to, we'll come back to you in just a moment, Max, if we may, Julien Théron, I'd like to ask you, it doesn't look as though the cycle of violence has come to end, one of those cases where uh, the truce may have been, uh, the deal may have been brought about by, by external pressure, but fundamentally, uh, the forces on the ground uh, do not agree, for a start, about where that crucial front line should pass, since Debal Tseve uh, would form a crucial part of any new line. Well, yes, actually, the heavy weaponry was supposed to, to be out from uh, today, actually. So Kiev says uh, that they will do start when the rebels stop uh, uh, firing at their troops. And uh, the rebels don't, do not stop. And every today, a, a senior rebel commander saying that uh, it's, it is a kind of moral obligation because the Beltsave is a part of their territory. But of course, if there's some firing, it's because it's not a part of their territory. And when you do sign an agreement, well, you have to do you do have to apply it. Uh, perhaps we can look at a map of uh, that front line that's at the heart of the Minsk uh, II agreement. We saw it a little earlier on. Perhaps we can bring it back and uh, have a look at where uh, that crucial town of uh, de Balseve uh, stands. Uh, uh, and it makes some sense of how it would affect uh, not just the front line, but the possible shape of a separatist uh, zone. I wonder, uh, Julian Nandi, whether looking uh, at that map, and you can see there clearly that for the time being, and according to the Minsk agreement, De Balseve sits on the other side of the line. If it falls to the separatists, that front line changes shape. Does that not mean that the deal is dead in the water? It has to be remembered that De Balseve is a very, very, very strategic uh, town. It's, it's a rail junction. 
and it's also a, a junction of two major roads. So for communications, and it's, it's an extremely important place for either side to hold on to or to, or to capture. Um, you asked the question about whether this means the end of the ceasefire. I would hate to be the person responsible for saying yes, but it certainly makes the ceasefire uh, increasingly untenable. Michel Grimbao, the uh, ceasefire being based on a line that appears no longer to stand tonight, is, it, is Minsk too dead? No, Minsk, Minsk II is not done, and I'm very glad, because uh, we were very close to a real war, and uh, now we, uh, in Minsk II, the, 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 the right positions were written down. So, but the Baltsevo is, is a real problem, because it's a very strategic place, and from the point of view of the separatists, uh, it's not concerned by the ceasefire. So uh, I know in Minsk, uh, Pr President Putin was talking, uh, 60, 16 hours were devoted to the Baltsevo uh, uh, during the conference in, in Minsk. So it's a very difficult problem, but we, we, I think we, we must uh, say that there is a process, and that a uh, very good process, I think. That's one thing. And the other, uh, the other problem is to, to solve the situation in the, in the Baltsevo. Uh, Anna Garmash, uh, even as uh, it looks as though the separatists seem to be winning the battle on the ground in De Balsevi, will it not be the case uh, if Minsk II is going to last, and given that it's the only game in town and the hope of the international community as well, will it not be the case that Kiev will simply be obliged to accept that it's lost the town? I think there is a question of principle for a very large extent, because when the Minsk agreement was signed, De Balsevi was still... Uh, held by, Ukra by Ukrainian forces and it technically there are still Ukrainian forces over there um, at the mo they were still there at the moment of uh, the at, at the moment when the ceasefire was supposed to be applied and they're still there technically so uh, the, the territory that, that is held by uh, Russian and pro-Russian fighters that was held at that moment should be so to speak theirs and the other uh, and and the rest should be uh, should sort of belong to the Ukrainian army. I don't think that should still be fighting going on. Technically, the Minsk agreement is not working. I'm sorry. Perhaps we can go back to Max, who's in Kiev. What are you hearing, uh, Max, about conditions for the people in Debaltsev? Of course, international observers haven't managed to get to the town for the fighting that's been going on there. What are people on the ground telling you about conditions in the town? It's been going on for so many weeks now. Yes, and, and when we were last in the town, the situation for them hasn't much changed. I mean, some people have uh, managed to be evacuated from the town. I think there's still about 2,000 people stuck there. Uh, and they essentially live in their basements, melting snow for drinking water. They've got no water, no food, uh, no electricity. It's, a, it's an absolutely dire situation for them, and the buildings are coming down all around them. Um, so those people that are stuck there, there's, there's really very little hope for, for them escaping from the situation alive. And the same goes from the soldiers who are now, uh, Ukrainian soldiers, are now stuck in isolated pockets of resistance, fighting off the separatist forces without ammunition and without food. It's a, it's a very difficult situation for all concerned. Are we not standing on the brink of a bloodbath then in Debaltsevo for those Ukrainian soldiers left? I, I think indeed we are, and I think the, the bloodbath has already started. Uh, we see, we're seeing more and more pictures of, of dead Ukrainian soldiers who try to break out of the encirclement. Um, bodies on the streets of civilians who have been hit by shells or caught in the crossfire. Uh, it, it is, it's already starting. Both sides have always played down their casualties quite drastically. Um, I mean, one of your uh, guests said earlier that we're on the brink of a real war. I think we've, we've been having a real war for quite some time. It's just that both sides play down their casualties. It has, uh, Julien Théron, one of the characteristics of all that's been going on in eastern Ukraine uh, has been uh, that uh, both sides have wanted to play things down. The fact of the matter is that over the last few months, 5,600 people have been killed. This has been a war. Yes, it's definitely a war. And uh, NATO and uh, yesterday or today, the EU actually signed a statement saying that there was uh, Russian forces inside uh, this area. So I think that uh, what is very important is, is not the question of the Baltsevo, uh, well, except for the people living there, of course. But if we let down the Baltsevo, tomorrow there will be another place where the rebels consider like their territory, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the south, near Mariupol, because there has been shellings over there since, uh, since uh, 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 this weekend, where it's supposed to be a ceasefire. So they will probably try to get more territory 
very again. And one of the main points, which was not treated by Minsk too, and which is very important, François Hollande and, and, and Angela Merkel really tried too, but is the control of the border between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And uh, Russia has definitely to put pressure on that and to let the OSC members to control this border as it is supposed to, to, to be done I'd with like Minsk. I'd like to come back to that question of the, uh, of the border between uh, Ukraine and Russia in a little while. First of all, I'd like to ask you what you think. If Debaltsev is allowed to fall to the separatists, uh, is there any limit to where the separatists will go? I mean, Kiev cannot allow it to happen simply because the line having been drawn uh, on the other side of the town, uh, Kiev, in order to uh, be credible, in order to stand firm, has to say that it cannot allow it. From my point of view, when the problem will be solved in the Baltic, uh, the, 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 the situation will be much more peaceful. But uh, the, the, two, uh, your, your, your journalist said that 2,000 people were stuck in, uh, in, uh, in the Baltic. There used to be uh, 6,000 or 7,000 uh, militaries or soldiers and officers. And so uh, it's like uh, the, the, the airport in Donetsk. It was the place which the, the, the official Ukrainian army could not abandon. Uh, and before the, the, the beginning of the ceasefire. So now it's, we have to solve this situation with, uh, as, uh, with, um, as, as well as possible. But uh, I, I think that uh, they will not go to Mariupol and, and uh, the, the limit is, is clear now. And uh, from my point of view, the, if, if the, the separatists will, will not go to Mariupol and, 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 and they, they will let people, uh, OSCE, and uh, control the border well, between OSCE Russia and Ukraine. OSCE was not allowed to enter the Baltsevé today. But the Baltsevé is, is a special problem. So we have to separate the Baltsevé and the rest of the situation, from my point of view. Julian Nandy, the question of De so much does seem to flow from the question of the It was because the fighting was going on today that the two sides said they wouldn't withdraw their heavy weaponry. Perhaps one can imagine a scenario where the Baltsevé, having de facto fallen to the separatists, it is decided by all sides uh, that the agreement can go now go ahead. I mean, perhaps there is a glimmer of a hope still that even if the Ukrainian uh, forces lose this town, uh, Minsk could be saved. Well, it would have to be uh, renegotiated slightly. I mean, this can obviously be done on the telephone. It can be doesn't have to don't have to get all these presidents back in Minsk to do it all again. But it would have to be um, there would have to be some new agreement, and it's very difficult to see how how Kiev would would, ex would agree to lose face uh, so completely. Anna, any think, glimmer of hope for it at all? It's very difficult to think so, um, because you cannot, if you have agreed on something, on this agreement, on those different points of the agreement, on a, on a, on a specific line, you cannot start shifting lines right after that. It's a question of trust. If you want a ceasefire, both, stop, both sides has to have to stop firing. Obviously, nobody is going to withdraw the Ukrainian army, army in particular, is not going to withdraw the heavy weapons if, there's, if they still feel like they're under attack. So I do not feel like there's anything that can go forward unless there is maybe something that's renegotiated because you really have to start with a clean um with a clean agreement. Julien Théron, much will depend, of course, on the force with which uh, the actions of the separatists are condemned, which is what Kiev has asked uh, the uh, West, NATO and the EU to do. Uh, so far, they haven't come out and condemned terribly forcefully what's been going on. And throughout this, although uh, Angela Merkel and François Hollande got very personally involved in this last week, precisely as a result of the encirclement uh, of uh, De Balseva, it's difficult to imagine uh, the uh, for, sort of forceful language it would take from either NATO or the EU uh, to, 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 to put down what's been done in De Balseva and to get the separatists to back off. It simply hasn't worked so far. The strength is not there on the other side. Because it does not depend off uh, the EU and NATO side, actually. It's on the Russia side to put pressure on the separatists and its own uh, forces over there. So, but actually, there will be an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, meeting in Estonia where, uh, from the EU where the General Secretary from NATO will be invited in the coming days. So there will be maybe a, a point where uh, the talk will be harder, actually. Uh, as for uh, any pressure that Moscow could put on the separatists, there hasn't been much of it so far. So the, I think the, the, the President Putin can put pressure on, on, on separatists, but to a, to a c c certain point. And, uh, and, um, but it's not so easy for him, too, because otherwise he would not have, have talks so long in Minsk, too, on, on these special topics. So, so uh, for him, it's a, it's a real problem. The, the next step for me uh, is, uh, is uh, of course, to, um, 
to 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 um, stop. Uh, the, the, the risk was that NATO could have been involved in the, in, in the in, in the process of the Americans, and I am very glad that that Europeans, that, that uh, President Holland and, and 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 Mrs. Merkel, Angela Merkel, uh, were, were helping solving the situation. Because the next step is to 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 force um, President Poroshenko, Poroshenko to talk to separatists. And they, he doesn't want to talk to him to them because he, for, for him, they are rebels. And, and the, real, the real issue is, is to force the separatists and the Ukrainian, the official Ukrainians to talk to, to each other. And, and, and we, we didn't reach this point to, to, to the, this moment. Is it time that Petro Poroshenko can speak to the rebels? Uh, one must consider in the first place who are those so-called rebels. I'd rather call them um, Russian and pro-Russian fighters because uh, there's been, there have been n numerous reports on the fact that Russian army is actually uh, fighting there. And the EU, as it was mentioned before, uh, yesterday, I think, actually recognized in their official papers that the army was there, within the sanctions, by the way, where they actually sanctioned people who were directly responsible for this uh, army involvement. Um, according to different types of organizations, uh, Russian organizations, I mean, uh, between the uh, Committee of Soldiers' Mothers or the um, uh, forgotten, forgotten Regiment, with also, which is also a committee for defense of uh, soldiers' rights, there's somewhere between 8,000 and 15,000 um, soldiers that they know of that are there or that have been there. Um, also, there are plenty of arms that have been supplied by Russia. In other words, um, Mr. Poroshenko is obviously supposed to talk to, to locals, to yes. people who are there. For However, sure. Sure. given that this so-called sure. rebellion has been foreign-led, um, obviously the first pe person he ha has to talk to is Mr. Putin. Well, we're going to come back to that in just a moment and talk about the extent uh, of Russian involvement in this. Also, what the next step is, since we haven't mentioned so far uh, with Washington having spoken recently of uh, potentially arming Kiev with uh, lethal aid. We're going to come back to that in just a moment in the second part of tonight's debate. Do stay with us. Welcome back. It's time for the second part of tonight's debate devoted to the Ukrainian ceasefire and whether or not it is, in fact, still alive. Tonight, fighting continues in the key town of Debal Seve, leaving that ceasefire which came into effect Saturday night looking increasingly shaky, shaky particularly after the deadline for the withdrawal of heavy weaponry from the front line came and went. Is the deal dead? That's what we're considering uh, tonight with my guest, Michel Grabar, who's the, a member of the Coordination Council of the Russian Farm here in France. Also with me is Anna Garmash, who's a Euromaidan activist and president uh, of uh, the Ukraine Action Association. Uh, here on the set, equally, Julian Nunley, who's an independent uh, journalist and knows the region uh, well. And, uh, of course, uh, Julien Theron, who is an analyst in geopolitics, the geopolitics of conflicts, and who teaches at the University of Versailles. We're also joined down the line from Kiev uh, by the editor for the Kiev Post, Max Tucker. I wanted to ask you, you've extensively been covering uh, the events in eastern Ukraine over the last few months. You have correspondence dotted throughout the region. We were talking earlier about the involvement of uh, regular Russian troops. Uh, what ha evidence of that have you seen? Well, uh, just yesterday, actually, there was a, um, a pro-Russian journalist who accidentally filmed a whole series of um, lined up uh, Russian T-72 B-3 tanks. Uh, those are only made in Russia. The separatists couldn't possibly have, have captured them. Uh, from the Ukrainian government forces. And they're also extremely uh, complicated, sophisticated, sophisticated equipment. And we've also seen that the US has released satellite images um, of very well-organized Russian artillery in the region. Uh, we've seen very sophisticated anti-aircraft equipment, which can only be uh, used by very trained professionals, which separatists should, simply wouldn't have had, had time to do that training in, this, in the, the months that they've had. Given, uh, Julien Theron, that there is very little doubt of uh, Russian uh, support for what's been happening in Eastern Ukraine now, a year after the crisis uh, began, uh, much, of course, uh, of what happens in Eastern Ukraine depends not at all on what Angela Merkel or François Hollande may or may not want, but entirely on what Vladimir Putin decides. And it seems that he hasn't decided in favor of peace for now. Well, it was still a very proud move from the Europeans because they agreed, for instance, not to talk about Crimea, which was completely illegally annexed. 
Uh, so they were kind of going there with very good intentions for peace in Ukraine. But of course, you can't talk with the people who fight, actually. It was said earlier that uh, Mr. Poroshenko should actually talk to the rebels, but they should stop firing uh, first. You can't talk to somebody who's firing at you. And the other point is that uh, uh, it was said as well that uh, Mr. Putin is very hard for him uh, to force the rebels to stop. Well, for instance, it's very easy to stop uh, supplying the rebels uh, and the Russian forces and to call back uh, people like Igor Strelkov, who is a member of the uh, Russian intelligence over there. So, I mean, there's a direct implication of, of Russia over there. So it's not that hard. Uh, it's just a question of uh, political decision. Uh, Michel Grabar, if that's true, then the real problem is that Vladimir Putin has not decided to allow this to end. I think he, he wants to solve the problem of the Baltsevo and afterwards uh, to, 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 to push, uh, to put pressure on Mr. Poroshenko to, in order him to, to meet the uh, so-called separatists or rebels. And uh, of course, he is controlling partly the situation. He's, he can, the Russians cannot say that officially, that's for sure, but, but, but it's obvious. But the, what is important is it, what could have uh, happened and, uh, and we could have had a real war in Mariupol, in Odessa, in Kharkiv, and and I am very I'm happy that it does it didn't happen, and and we so now people are just uh, focused on the Balsavo. That's important we, uh, for sure. There are people, there are troops, uh, people, soldiers dying there. But but uh, in in comparison with with what could happen, uh, uh, we are, we can be very happy that Mr. Poroshenko was uh, was had to to. For him, it's, he, he lost the face. He, 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 for him, it's a very difficult, it means negotiation, for sure. But he, he, he lost. But, what, but from my point of view, it's good for peace in Europe. That is the point, uh, Julian Nandi, is that even as this deal was signed in Minsk last week, it was the weakness of the Ukrainians that we were reminded of. It seemed uh, to include, of course, many of the problems from the Ukrainian point of view, the acceptance that there is a de facto separatist zone in Ukraine, but actually also then forced Kiev to pay for the rebel area. So it went even further than Minsk once one had against uh, the interests of Kiev. Yes, indeed. Um, Kiev did not come out of that one um, winning at all. But I mean, they, I think everyone would win if the killing were to stop. Uh, and if the, if the fighting were to stop, then there would be, there would be more chances. We're talking about Poroshenko needing to talk to the rebels. There was actually a meeting in Minsk a couple of weeks before um, where the rebel leaders went, yeah. and their attitude was extremely difficult. It was, it was, it was under OSCE um, auspices, and they were virtually not talking. And the problem, of course, Anna, and, 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 and this is the reason, no doubt, those talks weren't terribly productive or the attitude was not the right one. The point is that uh, as long as these separatists are winning on the ground, they have no interest at all in stopping fighting. It seems like that, indeed, that they, they want to... Um take as much ground as, as they can. And it, it's been looking like that for a while, and it still looks like that. Nothing has changed. The ceasefire hasn't changed anything, that's for sure. So if De Balseve, uh, Max, if you're still joining us from Kiev, uh, falls, and we're reminded once again of the strength of the separatists on the ground, uh, is Kiev going to be calling for Washington uh, to come through on what it had suggested it might be thinking about, which is arming uh, Ukrainian regular forces? Oh, Ukraine is already desperately calling on Washington and its uh, allies in Europe to, to arm Ukrainian forces and help them fend off what's now quite clearly not just a separatist attack, but an assault by Russian armed forces. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you talked about Minsk one there. I mean, we were talking then about Donetsk airport and who uh, Donetsk airport uh, belonged to. And the, the, the theory was that after the fighting for Donetsk airport, perhaps the issue would be solved. But now we're talking about Debaltsev, it's the second town. It's a huge rebel offensive that has, has got them this far. So really, the, 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 the separatists show absolutely no sign of being really interested in peace or talking. Um, and as long as they're making territorial gains, they'll probably continue with that attitude. Uh, yes, but there is a slight difference that uh, for the, during the fight for Donetsk airport, there was no agreement, no frame. Now we have a frame and, 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 and things are written down. So we know what, what the, the process can be. And uh, that, uh, that makes a very substantial difference from my point of view.
Is that like, could it make a difference, Max? Do you think that the fact that there's an agreement now uh, behind Debal Civic, could that, could that help mean that once the guns have fallen silent around the town, should it fall entirely to the separatists, then perhaps the rest of the agreement can be pushed through? Well, I think there was a, a very clear agreement on Minsk 1 that both sides should stop shooting. And that, that agreement was not only not followed, but the separatists launched an offensive all along the entire Ukrainian line. I mean, clearly, the separatists have no interest in a ceasefire. Uh, they just want to grab as much territory as they can. Julien Theron, uh, Washington had been quite clear. Uh, it was uh, considering coming uh, back, or coming on, or looking at this idea very seriously. A number of key people seem to have been convinced over the course of the last few weeks that it was now time to consider providing uh, lethal aid uh, to uh, Ukraine. Uh, that talk was stopped with uh, the flurry of diplomatic activity kicked off by Angela Merkel and uh, François Hollande last week that led to Minsk too. But Washington remained very clear, if Minsk too failed, that talk will come back. Is it now time for the United States to help Ukraine from a material point of view, to gain the upper hand on the ground? Well, it's not my role to, to, to get or advise the political uh, decision. But what is very important to see that we are facing a very difference of political culture between Russia and the West. What we try to, be, uh, to build in Europe is a, a politics of cooperation. So we try to negotiate, talk and, and establish agreements. And if we can't do that, it means that there's w just one thing remaining, which it means uh, containment, actually. So, and uh, what means very precisely cooperation? It means when we do have an agreement, the agreement is implemented. And today in the Baltic, it's not the case. So, and it's the second round. And like I said, like we have been very willing fool the French and, and German uh, government going there and, and not speaking, for instance, about Crimea. It was, it was a very nice move uh, uh, toward Mr. Putin. But if we do it was, fail... It was a reminder of the West's weakness on this, was it not? It was good intentions, I guess. And, uh, and it was to save, I agree with that, it was to save peace in Europe. So it was good intentions. Mm -hmm. But the point is that if we just have a glance on this situation, the rebels just and, and the Russian forces over there just go ahead. So if we can't talk, if we can't, can't apply the, the agreements, well then we have to contain Russia again like we did, like with the USSR, I mean. Through the supply of weapons to Ukraine? Well, it, it is asked. There was elections. Russia backed the rebels because saying that otherwise the new Kiev, like so-called neo-Nazi regime, will just organize a massive repression of uh, the Russian speakers, which absolutely did not happen. And then, I mean, like there was some free elections uh, under the survey of the OSCE, like you were part of. And uh, so, if it's not like that, it's it's not happening like that. So, uh, if there was no so if there's no other solution, well, maybe yes. I don't agree because people. But when uh, 600,000 uh, people uh, fl uh, fled to, to Russia and 900,000 fled to other towns and places in Ukraine. So, so there was, the, there was, there's no one single aggression of Russian speaking in, in Ukraine. But there, there were casualties. There are people, uh, children, uh, because dead of the fights. In, because of the fights, because of the fights, and because of the, 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 the bad ceasefire uh, and the not very clear situation when people. W came down and were shot because they were not at the right place at the right moment. So, so the, the situation w was not clear. Now the situ situation is much clearer. And so, uh, so to, you, you, to you mean that the Poroshenko is, is kind of uh, the head of a neo-Nazi regime? No, no, oh. no. But he 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 was uh, Maidan. I had students and uh, very very nice people on the Maidan, and I understand that they prefer to live like uh, as in Poland. Uh, and, and um, I understand this, this idea of Euro European uh, idea of, 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 of young uh, Ukrainian students. And uh, for sure, Mr. Yanukovych was not a good president. So I, there is no, no debate about that. But, but what, what can, we can say that they also Mr. Poroshenko and other people, Kalamoyevsky and this kind of people, uh, uh, used um, also neo-fascist groups to, uh, to, to, to win on the mine, on Maidan. And so you know that, everybody knows that. But I wanted to just to, to answer maybe the question you, 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 you raised. So, the, so uh, the, the, the bad idea would, would be to invite the United States to, to come back in the debate and, uh, and to, to put down the idea of Crimea back 
uh, on the table to uh, to rearm Ukraine because it's not a way to solve the situation. What is important is uh, is to solve. That there is, of course, you 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 win. You of course you can lose, but uh, we are moving to a solution. That's because, what uh, France and Germany tried to do. I, I agree too. absolutely, and so and and Mr. Poroshenko, I think has to understand that and put into because it's bad it's very bad for russia these the, the sanctions the so it's oh, the situation is bad for russia for bad for europe it's bad for ukraine ukraine could have ceased to exist so, so it's better to have such a U ukraine with with the border maybe with a, a more auto on a autonomous uh, uh, parts of, uh, of ukraine on, on the eastern part but but you have still a country and i think a person can understood that that he could have have, have lost very much. Uh, Julian Landy, it's, it's important here that Poroshenko and Washington are not tempted to uh, take on force by force, but rather keep the possibility of talking even after Debaltsev. I think you'll find on, on, on the Western side there's a great hesitation about, about sending arms of any, of any description, whether they're purely defensive or not, mm -hmm. because anything, will be, anything could be seen as a provocative gesture. Um, so there's, there's this problem between a, a rock and a hard place here. Do you arm them or don't you? And if you do, what are the consequences? And if you don't, what are the consequences? And this seems, seems to be a, a debate with no answer. But I think uh, we must give Mr. Poroshenko more credit for understanding what's going on than, than uh, is being given here. And we should also remember there's always talk about neo-Nazis and the far right and so on. The far right in last spring's presidential elections got less than 2% in the vote, which is a good deal less than you get in France. The elections yeah. is one thing, but to, to uh, even for, for, for a revolution, there, there must be not just very nice students, but also people who, who know how to fight. Uh, and in Od Odessa, for instance, what happened in, in Odessa was a terrible. And, and, and the, 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 the ultra right were involved in that. I'd yeah. like to put it to Anna Gamash. You were, of course, on Maidan. You were part of the revolution. But it is a reminder, is it not, that there are two very different views in Ukraine about what happened uh, at the time of the Ukrainian revolution. And there are those in eastern Ukraine who had legitimate fears about what it would mean to them uh, and uh, who welcomed what the separatists were doing. There are some people who were thinking that, of course, uh, that is undeniable. Um, however, there is a certain media image that was projected that was not, ne not necessarily true, projection, projected, by the way, by the Russian media in the first place mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. Because uh, having been on the Maidan, uh, there were obviously, as in any sort of revolution, some far-right forces, but they are extremely minor. They were a bit more visible, obviously, because they were a bit more violent, but they were extremely, there was a very, very th thin minority of those people. However, when you ask those living in the East, are you afraid of those, um, are you afraid of those people, of those so-called um, Bandera fighters or something like this? They say, yes, I am. This is the, what I'm afraid of. Have you seen any so far? No, none of them. Well, you're afraid of a ghost in the end. On that question of perceptions, uh, though, uh, Julian Nandi, uh, uh, and going back to the question of the American, the possible American arming of Ukrainian forces, were uh, Minsk to, to fail, were uh, Washington to uh, decide to arm uh, uh, Kiev, uh, would that not simply reinforce Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin's clear perception uh, that uh, Eastern Ukraine and through Eastern Ukraine, Russian interests are under threat uh, from Washington, the EU, NATO? This is what has been at the heart of his own decision to support the separatists. Yeah, definitely. But uh, you could have observed that uh, Ukrainian forces are not accused to be in Russia today. Uh, so, so the debate is a little bit uh, tricked. But he's a very clever man. And when we have to ask the question and to answer to that, it, we are already uh, in his game, actually. Because, of course, if we don't do anything, well, Ukraine can be eaten, just like the Baltava today. Or if we do something like giving weapons uh, to Ukraine, it's just like what you said, and what you said as well. Then, yes, it will be seen as a provocation for, for Moscow. But in both ways, we're losing. So we definitely have to 
counter and to, to turn around this trouble and to find a, a peaceful solution, that would be the best. One of the extraordinary things you mentioned earlier, the difficulty for Vladimir Putin, the sanctions, the state of the Russian economy uh, and so on. Uh, nothing seems to have dented his popularity at home, on the contrary. And he seems in this extraordinary position of force when it comes to Ukraine. Nothing anyone can do opposite seems to stop him making the advances or having the upper hand. So because he, he's controlling the medias and he has a very good tool and it's, it's the Russian nationalism and the, the, the revival of the Second World War and the idea of Bandera, the fa fascists, and he, he uh, of course, very, it's, it's clever, but it's, it's working. And, and uh, it, it, of course, in the eastern part of Ukraine, people are, are watching television, Russian television, and there is a propaganda saying that, uh, that it, it's, it's, it's very close to what happened in, during the Second World War or even during the, uh, the Napoleon War when the, the West was uh, marching on Russia. So, but, uh, and, and that's a propaganda. And it, it, that works when the, the the situation uh, in Russia is complicated, but w but of course he he understands that he, he he wants to solve the situation in in Russia, and he cannot do that without the West. Russia needs Western technology, uh, in in uh, in uh, energy, in electronics, and, and and so for for Russia this situation is very bad. So he he was he's not he doesn't want to to control to eat uh, Ukraine. That's that's a, that's a, it's a myth or uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, he he wants to to to, to have a, a good situation in his country because he he lost very in, ter in terms of confidence very much, and uh, he maybe had he took Crimea, but uh, in terms of confidence he he, he he lost the confidence of the West, and that's very important. But he's him. also he's also has he not Julian Nandi uh, proved to the West his extraordinary strength, which will redefine the relationship between. Uh, Moscow and the rest of the world uh, in a number of different uh, geopolitical arenas over the coming years? Well, I think the, the, well, the relationship is redefined, obviously, and, uh, and it's going to take some years for to return to a, a state of trust between, uh, between the two sides. Um, the problem seems to be, from my viewpoint, is that, that things have been going step by step, that it's difficult to see whether there is a, there is a, a plan, a policy, um, over several years, or whether this has just been um, a, a, a piece by piece action, and it looks very much like that. Um, but over, during all these months, there have been no amount of pressure the West has brought to bear has really had any effect, and that is pretty uh, pretty worrying. From your point of view, uh, Anna, and those who took part in the revolution. Uh, uh, we're looking, and the best case scenario is that Minsk too holds, at the de facto separation of Ukraine into two separate parts, with Moscow keeping a certain amount over, of influence over a substantial part of the country. Uh, is the revolution something uh, now that its activists have come to regret? Um. Not at all, actually, because uh, in the first in the first place, nobody could have ever imagined that it would end up like this. In the very beginning of of the Maidan um, demonstrations, if somebody had told me that uh, a, uh, an open war would be happening in Ukraine, I'd never ever believe this. Um, and it was a genuine effort uh, to bring some to bring some um, state of state of law or some to eliminate corruption to bring some human rights into Ukraine so uh, we're never going to regret this because there are still efforts going on from the civil society to improve the state of the government obviously we call this revolution however a revolution is something that sort of ended in the end uh, this movement has en hasn't ended so far uh, obviously this has been a sort of regime change uh, another president was elected but the point is not in electing just a different president and, and hoping that everything's going to be fine from now on the point was in trying to change the system as far as we could go and obviously this doesn't happen from one day to another nobody is naive enough to think so so there's still a lot of efforts to to try to lobby the government into passing laws um, if there is a lot of effort in, for uh, help for the army obviously uh, also for the refugees there's a lot of things that are going on within the civil society to uh, improve the state it's still going on obviously but, but while, there's, while there's a war going on um, all the efforts at reform getting rid of corruption are slowed down considerably because the priority is obviously 
going to be the security situation. And this, and this, was, is, this, this is, creates an, uh, an internal domestic danger. Which, which, was, which was, they say, part of Vladimir Putin's calculation in all this. The problem is that the money that the, 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 the Ukraine will get from Europe, from Europe or from, from, from the West will, must be uh, totally or partly uh, uh, used by the building of, of an army. And that, that's very bad. Instead of doing reforms or reforming economics and so on, the, uh, Poroshenko can, could have uh, built an, an army. And, and, and uh, so... Well, we, I think we have to go back to the context. The context is uh, when I talk to, to Ukrainian people, they, they say, let us decide what we want for us. It's not the, 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 the point of it. We are Ukraine. We, we are a state. We, we can do what we want. Why, and, and, but, but my answer is very clear. That, but you, your, your main neighbor, neighbor is Russia. And if you, if you become a part of NATO, he, it's, 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 for, for Russia, it's very dangerous. Like you, you, cannot, you cannot make such decisions alone. I'd like to put uh, to uh, you, Julien Theron, the words of Petro Poroshenko within the last few minutes. He's described the rebel actions in De Balseve as a cynical attack on uh, the peace field. He's been speaking uh, to Angela Merkel. Uh, and he's appealing to the United Nations to prevent uh, further violations. And he says the full scale and full scale military operations in the heart of Europe. He's demanded a tough response from the West over uh, against Russia over the broken truce. The point is he's very unlikely to get it. Well, like you said, he was uh, appearing like as feeble in Minsk. He accepted to be dishonored over there. But if it doesn't work, we, he doesn't have many tools. It's rather the UN or NATO, but he can't do much about it. And clearly, he wanted to, to uh, establish a full uh, reform program for the country. But he can't do that in this situation, you're right. And uh, it's a main failure for Ukraine, and it's a way for Russia to, to keep Ukraine a little bit under control. So, and it's a very bad situation in the end. Of course, for the both. trouble, Julian Nandis, the UN Security Council has by definition been divided on this issue and remarkably inefficient. The only tough response Mr. Poroshenko could hope for would come from Washington, and it would come in the form of supplying weapons, and it's something that divides the United States from its European allies. It's, yes, and it's also, you may have noticed that President Obama has, has not shown any great enthusiasm for this idea. This has been coming from a lot of some hawks in, in Congress and so on. Uh, so I think there's, there's, it's not a given that the United States is prepared to give uh, this better arms to Ukraine. Well, meanwhile, uh, the fighting continues uh, in Debal Sivi this evening with that uh, ceasefire, of course, in uh, the balance will continue to follow uh, events uh, there and any further developments over the course of the evening. Thank you very much to all my guests for having been with us this evening. Uh, thank you also uh, to Max, who's joined us from uh, Kiev with the latest uh, from the ground in eastern uh, Ukraine. That brings us to the end of uh, tonight's uh, debate. We'll be back again uh, for another debate at the same time tomorrow to join us then.